welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The Department of Energy released the long-awaited draft base case update to the integrated resource plan this week. Terence Greenman joins me to discuss what this means. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. What is the IRP and what was released this week? Well the IRP is a planning tool for electricity and the, the new generation that's going to come into the system. The famous IRP 2010 which was published in uh, 2011 uh, gave us a horizon until 2030 and it set out allocations for different technologies with nuclear, coal, wind, solar, so, uh, so CSP, etc. And then the minister uses that tool and sets determinations. And once you have a determination, then a procurement process arises if it's not an ESKIM build. And uh, once the procurement process is done and prices are fixed, then the, uh, the developers build that capacity. But obviously, the Eskim, uh, Eskim build is a bit of a different process, as we've seen with Madupi and Kusili. They go off a, on a different uh, framework, but they are built into the RP, um, as is the existing capacity. So it's a very important tool. And what we saw released uh, this week is the, the long-awaited updates to that RP, not the full final version, but the base case assumptions, uh, base case with the assumptions that back that. And we see a, a, what, and they've also extended the horizon to 2050. So it's a, a much longer horizon, and uh, they've they've given us an indication now as to where the different technologies will fit in, and how they should be scheduled and allocated to be built over that period. Were there any surprises in the base case? I think some some of the surprises, uh, you know, the headline was that nuclear has been pushed back. Um, so we won't need nu nuclear for 21 years. So initially in the RP 2010, uh, nuclear was expected the first 1,600 megawatts was going to come in uh, in 2023 and building up to that magic figure of uh, 9,600 megawatts by 2030. Now what the new modeling uh, with under the new assumptions, because we've obviously had a much slower growing economy, in fact we've had negative uh, growth in terms of uh, e electricity demand, so we've, uh, we need to roll out these uh, things a lot more slowly, uh, suggests that we only need uh, the first nuclear reactor of about 1,400 megawatts in 2037, so quite a long time away. And uh, so that was, I suppose, a, a surprise, but there's still quite a lot of nuclear, which is also surprising, um, in the mix to 2050. So there's still about a, a, a 20,000 megawatt of nuclear in the mix all the way to 2050, but then pushed back uh, its actual deployment much uh, into a much longer horizon. The, the other surprise, I suppose, is the total exclusion of uh, concentrated solar power from the mix. This one was, I think, in 2010, there was a lot of hopes uh, around CSP. It was, it's a new technology. It allows you to basically dispatch uh, solar, you know, solar photovoltaic, which everyone knows uh, the panel on the roof, for instance, is not dispatchable. As the sun goes up, um, that's when you start producing electricity, and when the sun goes down, you stop. With CSP, uh, there was a lot of excitement around the fact that you could use uh, technologies, power towers, uh, solar troughs, uh, to form almost like a battery using molten salts where you could produce during the day, but then you could also store, electric, uh, store energy for dispatch during the night. And uh, so there was, as I was saying, there's quite a lot of excitement, but it always came in very expensive. And the, the learning curves there and the learning rates uh, and the price reductions haven't been as dramatic as what we've seen in wind and solar PV. So the big winners other than nuclear being confirmed in the mix are wind and uh, solar PV. Uh, and gas in, in South Africa's future mix up to 2050. So wind, wind allocation goes up quite dramatically over the period. I have to just look at the figure, but it's 17,600 megawatts uh, of wind and for solar PV, um, oh, sorry, 17,600 megawatts for solar PV and 37,400 megawatts for wind. So in total, those two renewable technologies, you know, if you think about nuclear being 20 gig, these would be 55 gig in this in this base case or something, so a very big chunk. And then we look at the two uh, gas related, the OCGT and the CCGT, at 13,000 uh, uh, 13, megawatts and 21,000 megawatts respectively. So fairly big chunks. 
And then this, besides CSP, the other big losers seem to be coal, which uh, new build between, say, 2020 and 2050, only 15,000 megawatts additional. And then uh, hydro, where they've only really allocated for the INGA, which we've sort of signed some uh, initial memorandums around with the DRC at around 2,500 uh, megawatts. So I think there are, I mean, there was a view possibly before that nuclear may feature in a much smaller way, um, but on the other hand, maybe earlier. So the fact that it's been pushed back to 2037, um, and, uh, but it remains fairly sizable uh, in the mix is probably a surprise. But I think also the exclusion of CSP is quite a big surprise. What do you make of plans by ESCOM to continue with the nuclear tender despite the IRP not being finalised? Well, that, that was really the headline moment of the week. You know, not so much what's in the base case because the base case is really the starting point for a discussion. So we, we're starting a public consultation process now and that public consultation process will have a provincial roadshows in December and January. There'll be an engagement with uh, the business and labour partners and community partners at NEDLAC um, during, the, during early next year. And the aim is then to get it into a, a form where you can have a poli what they call a policy adjustment discussion um, within government. So government will look at their other policies, their macroeconomic policies, their environmental policies, etc., and look at how they align all those to the, the integrated resource plan before it's sent to cabinet for approval. And that policy adjustment process is, is, will be quite uh, critically, will be closely watched because it's often during those policy adjustment phases that things like nuclear come into the mix because on a least cost basis, which the plan, um, the, the plan is really looking for the least cost solution for South Africa, um, you, you make some uh, economic trade-offs during that policy adjustment given that what you want to do maybe around jobs or uh, jobs or uh, localization around certain industries. So it's going to be closely watched. And then the view is that by sort of March, April, this will go to cabinet for promulgation and then that will become our new, our new plan. But the, the, uh, the headline grabber was that Eskim said no, they are going to proceed now as the procurer. Now you must understand this is a fairly new development. The cabinet only uh, last month really made this uh, um, decision that Eskom be not only the owner and operator of nuclear power plants, but also the procurer. Up until that point, that had been ceded to the Department of Energy, because Eskom, um, which was initially looking at nuclear in 2008, just felt it didn't have the balance sheet wherewithal to do it, and so they ceded it to the DOE. The DOE has now ceded it back to Eskom, so they're really running the show. And Eskom's uh, head of generation, Machida Coco, made it clear that while the base case is 30, uh, 2037, there, is, there are other scenarios, and there are, um, there, there's a number of sample scenarios associated with the base case. And one of the sample scenarios suggests that uh, we may need nuclear earlier. So this takes the base case and adds a, what they call a carbon budget. So at the moment we use our peak um, uh, plateau and decline carbon constraint in terms of our commitments for draw, drawing up this plan, a carbon budget will be much more stringent, takes the carbon budget, and then it also puts restrictions on how much renewables can be added into the mix yearly based on grid capacity constraints or maybe an inability to procure at the rate that you were hoping. So they sort of, sort of human-made <laughs> assumptions that they've added into that. And when you do that, the first nuclear reactor is needed by 2025. So. Um, Machila Coco is arguing that we can't delay and therefore we have to put out the, the request for proposal, the tender, uh, into the market before the end of the year so that the different vendors can give us feedback. And he did, but he did make a distinction between a tender and testing the market and signing a contract. Although I think in the current climate where there's a lot of mistrust for the nuclear program, this will add to that the, the level of mistrust because it just seems like even though we put out an RP, we're going to ignore what's in it. Um, and we're also going to ignore what's going to be in the final plan. And the final plan, as I say, th this is one sample assumption out of 12 they've tested. And there could be very, very many more. 
that could be tested in the future, some of which could exclude nuclear entirely. But uh, that, <laughs> be that as it may, Eskom says that we need to put out this tender so that we can be prepared because there's a 10-year gestation period. We've already run out of that 10 years if we're looking at 2025, 2026. And therefore, we have to put out this very unpopular RFP before the RFP. Uh, well, um, and uh, because we have to do it so that we are in a position to have our design at a design freeze so that we can build uh, a nuclear project, unlike what happened in the past. And this is where th the logic comes in. In the past, we only started planning for Madupi, Kusili and Gula far too late. And we couldn't actually get it to a design freeze before we started construction in Lepalale and in Pumalanga and KwaZulu-Natal. And therefore, you saw what happened with the, the costs going out of kilter, the timelines going mad, and we can't be in that position again. So there's the, the method in the madness, is that we need this uh, planning, we need this, this cost certainty from the vendors. We need to therefore go out on tender. Um, and we, uh, you know, we need to get some certainty as to whether we can afford this. But as I say, I think uh, putting, it's, it's, many will see this as putting the cart before the horse. And I think some people are definitely keeping their legal power, powder dry. And I think besides the actions that have already been taken by the faith groups and the environmentalists, we could see some other action should uh, Eskom decide to proceed with uh, releasing this tender uh, before the end of the year. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.